broke it again. No, I turned it down. That's what. Hello, I'm Robin Vincent, and welcome to this Molten Music Technology special here from the Toman synth reactor somewhere in darkest Germany. I've brought together two of the synthesizers that I thought were the most interesting things from the NAM show that's just passed. One was at the NAM show, one kind of wasn't, but it was still there in a party down the road and seemed to be one of the more interesting things to come out of the show. I mean, there was a stack of interesting stuff, but these two really jumped out as something a little bit different to look at. So, on the one hand, we have the Crave from Behringer. It's a, it's a little synth. It's a little synth, it's got a bunch of knobs, got a bunch of patch type holes in it. It makes one sound at a time, and it has a, a little keyboard and a sequencer. The other side, we have the Arturia Micro Freak, which has got a weirdo keyboard thing on it, a digital oscillator, and knobs that aren't necessarily doing what they say they are. So when I thought this was a brilliant idea to bring these two things together, I thought because they're a bit similar like, and they're not in any way, having now spent five minutes with each of them, they are very, very different, very different. So what the plan is, I don't know, I'm trying to waste an hour while it's raining outside, but otherwise, I'll see if I can make sounds of this, I'll see if I can make sounds of this and just talk about it as I go, because that's what we do. That's what we do. So, this one has a little keyboard. This has often been compared to the Mother 32, I think, in functionality, and that may be well what it is, but then synthesizers actually, I'm discovering, the more time I spend with synthesizers is how similar they all are, really. They all do a similar sort of thing. You've got like an oscillator in that, and then a filter, and then a, an envelope, and then stuff. So we know how these things work. So what is particular about the Crave, though, is that what it says is what you get. Because, again, suddenly having access to all these different synthesizers here, I am rediscovering my... Uh, my inner angst with presets and why I understand presets to be a good thing, a helpful thing often, but also I get frustrated with them because as soon as you select a preset, the knobs no longer mean anything. I mean, I keep trying to, you know, talking to manufacturers to get them to make uh, motorized knobs, but apparently no one's interested in that. Uh, the expense apparently is enormous. So, uh, but with something like the Crave, what you see is what you get. So the noise you're making is completely relevant to where the knob positions are. So I know that the filter's there, and I know what I move, it will go up, or it will go down. Uh, I know where the resonance is, and I can control that directly. So everything that I do is informed and intelligent. I make a decision, and I, and I, move, and I move the knob. You can't do that if you've selected a preset, and now everything, all the markers on a knob now point to something irrelevant to the patch that you've selected. And that may become clear in a minute when I have a poke on this one. But let's stick with the Crave to start with. What do we know? Oh, uh, I don't know. It's got, let's do a thing that you can do an arpeggiator. Now, I don't know about you, I find that incredibly helpful to have an arpeggiator or something of that nature and a hold button because it makes you feel like you're making music straight away, even though you haven't really written anything. You've just held a few things down, but it allows you to explore uh, something. Any synth that doesn't have any facility like that is nuts, I think. It's a it's a brilliant thing. Let me do that again. What was I doing? Because it's sounding really good. We'll go with that, we'll go with that. Thank <laughs> you. 
See, that's a marvellous thing. <laughs> I could sit here and play with that for hours. And you know exactly, I mean, if you know anything about synthesis at all, you know exactly what's going on. I mean, more or less, I mean, there's some surprises that happen. We've then just got to play with it a couple of times and it all starts to become clear. But there's nothing secret, there's nothing hidden, there's nothing weird going on. Everything goes to where it's supposed to go. You flick the switch and that does what that does and that then moves to that. And you can just spend time creating different sounds. Of course, every sound is lost. Every sound is evolving into another sound and there's no way to get back to that sound necessarily unless you think about what you're doing and know about what you're doing. I don't really know about what I'm doing, but it's an immensely enjoyable experience just to sit here and, and play with the thing. And that's gotta be nice. It's good and well constructed. They're not gonna thank me for moving that <laughs> uh, camera wise, but it's a solid little thing. Is that real wood on the side? Do you care? No, I don't really care. But it's a great little little synth. It makes the sort of sound you expect it to, and you can just play on it without any bother whatsoever. The microfreak then is a completely different story. And not necessarily in a bad way, don't mean that in a bad way at all, just different. The first time you look at it, uh, the first time I looked at it, it's like, but what? Because nothing does quite what you expect it to until you start digging down. And again, we hit, this is the point that we hit, the preset thing, the preset issue, the preset um, conundrum, perhaps, because it has a whole of presets inside, that's fine, and things jump around, you go, oh, that's interesting, because the microfreak, most importantly, is digital. The oscillator is digital. There's analog stuff in there too, it's all analog bits of circuitry and stuff, but the oscillator itself is digital and everything could be saved within it. So you could pick a preset, that one for instance, whatever that is, bounce key para. Yeah, awesome. And you press down knobs. And then you embarrassingly moved on to another preset. Let's try that one. There we go. 
we go. That's the sound. Now, the sound you're going to get from the Micro Freak is immediately unimpressive. It's immediately uh, digital and weird sounding. But that's okay, because I'm going to dig in a little bit deeper and hopefully it will start to reveal itself. Because there's some interesting, interesting, interesting stuff in here. The presets I've not been so uh, particularly bold over by. <laughs> The keyboard is weird. Absolutely it is. That's the first thing people are going to ask is what's the keyboard like? It's weird, is all I can say. Uh, you know, it's weird like a Roly is weird or like the Jouet is weird. It's weird in that kind of, it's not a piano keyboard, although it looks a bit like one. And so it doesn't give you that feel. So that's in, your brain is immediately going, oh, it's just a bit weird. So, no, that doesn't do anything. There's a pressure thing going on. Maybe not on that particular patch. Maybe I'll make something that will make that happen. I don't know. So, I mean, for me, the keyboard is, is kind of no more or less functional than the one over here. I mean, this is, is buttons. And uh, not remotely musically, musical. Uh, whereas this one is more musical, I suppose, in its, in its layout, in the way that you can access it. But it still doesn't feel particularly awesome. <laughs> I'm trying to decide if it's a good idea or not. I mean, these kinds of touch plate keyboards do hang around in, in Eurorack and stuff like that. And they do offer you know, something different in, in terms of things like pressure and aftertouch, which perhaps you don't get quite so much with a, with a regular piano keyboard. So, you know, I'm prepared to give it the benefit of the doubt, I suppose. But what we should do, because I mean, I could sit here and fiddle through presets, but I don't think... I don't think that tells you anything about it, because it could be anything. So, instead, what we'll do, I think, if I go far enough, I can find an empty patch, which just gives us a wave. Now it's a digital oscillator, which is all represented on these orange knobs here. And you can choose between, I think, 11 types at the moment. There's basic ways. It's got a little display here, which is, which is pretty interesting. I like it. It doesn't always stay lit, which is a shame. I mean, I guess it goes off maybe, I mean, they have a battery pack option for this, so perhaps it's a power saving device. I don't know, but I'd kind of like it to default to some kind of waveform display, but you know, Neither here nor there, really. So this first one, you can go through different types. You've got basic waves, super waves, wave tables, harmo, harmo, I don't know what that is, uh, car plus strings, that's kind of plucky stuff, I suspect. Um, what does that say? Piva, uh, and then Pi Wave Super, and then Pi FM. Pi, could be, could be Platts. I suppose I probably should have asked before I borrowed it. It's got chords. So yeah, they could well be from the the, the Platts module, which because this has this uh, mutable instruments built in oscillator as well that they uh, they borrowed with permission uh, from mutable instruments to stick in there. So maybe that's what that's about. But anyway, let's start off with a basic wave. So once you've selected your type, you then select the wave within that uh, with the second knob. And on the display here, you get these three bottles which fill up with stuff as you change them. So that's your morph being between, I mean, it sounds a bit squarey to triangly to signy. And then you've got a tombre, tombre uh, thing, which I guess is pulse width if you're talking about a square wave. And then you've got a shape, wouldn't that be? No, no, that's a sub. So the functionality of these buttons, of these knobs rather, changes depending on what you've selected, which is very versatile, but again, it's that thing where I don't know what it is. It says shape here, and it's not changing the shape, it's changing something else. I mean, I'm a simple man with simple needs, you know, and I just like to know what things do. So 
So another type would be the super wave. That's less morphy, more jumpy. You've got some detuning. On the tombra button, you've got a knob, rather. You've got detuning between the oscillators. And then volume for shape, obviously. Uh, wavetable. Now, wavetable is the sort of digital that we expect to hear. It's the sort of sound that we expect to hear from some kind of digital oscillator. And you can move through different tables, and then I imagine morph through the position. And then the final knob becomes chorus. So after that, you get harmo. Ooh. Harmonic content, there you go. It says content when you turn that knob. Well, it gets a bit shrill. Next up is car plus, which is your sort of, uh, what's the form of synthesis? I've talked about it before and I, I can't remember, but it's to do with uh, plucky typey sounds. It does something really clever with a delay and uh, a noise, I think. And you can kind of move between a bowed sound to a more of a pizzicato sound. Well, there we go. Nice. And then, presumably, it's into uh, something from uh, the mutable parts. FM there for you. Ouch. There's a chord, which gives you kind of like the, the end to a Game Boy uh, something or other. interesting so yeah I mean you can explore those in your own time frankly but what I think I'd like to do is just try to explore some of the other bits and pieces in it because I mean it's a digital oscillator it has lots of different sort of waveforms to start with and you can easily get sort of lost down a rabbit hole with just going bink 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 moving through moving through moving through whereas on the Crave it kind of just has the one or two waveforms which you can move between so the accessibility, if you like, to this is immediate, whereas to this, it takes a bit of time. Not to say that time's not rewarded, no, but it's, not, it's just not the same thing. And that's what I'm finding interesting at the moment. So let me choose a super wave, because I think they sound quite nice. I'm gonna set uh, an arpeggiator going again. How did I do that? No, that's a sequencer. I do a thing with that, press that button. And uh, it's on, it's not running, it's gonna work. So what am I not doing in that case? Da -da, let's try that bit. Go on with you. God damn it! Mmm. External clock. External clock could be. No, no, it's good, it's worth a try. Ha-ha! <laughs> Your man knows. Well, thank goodness for that, I thought I was going nuts.
So right, once you've got a sound going, then some of the normal things will start to happen. You've got a filter, an analog filter. You have an envelope. And you have this other cycling envelope here. And of course an LFO. So what I want to do is try to make something interesting happen. So once you've got beneath the surface, I want to try to understand how you start making the microfreak interesting. And where it becomes interesting is in this matrix here. Because this is where you can tell things what to do. So for instance, this cycling envelope here, this reminds me very much of a function within maths, where you've got rise and fall. So if I can remember, what I can do is I move this thing here. I can take the cycle envelope, that's what I want to do. I can take the cycle envelope to say the cutoff and turn that up. Put this into loop mode, which is something that I understand. Okay, starting to find it now. So what the cycling envelope is doing is just giving me a very quick LFO. Into which you can also introduce hold if you so wish. But then what becomes more interesting, at least from my point of view, is if you take the LFO and then mess that into the other envelope. So I want to control the changing of the rise so that changes with the LFO I can do this using the assignables on here so I'm going to go to LFO assignable one put that in I'm going to hold the assign button I think and turn rise oh no put that back there rise time Turn that up. So now what I've got is an LFO which is affecting the rise time, which is making that uh, cycling envelope affect the filter much quicker and then it takes it away again. So it's doing it slowly and slowly and then it brings it together and does it really fast.
See, that's interesting. At least to me. Anyway, so starting to sort of dig in a little bit, you can now start to get interesting things to happen. Now, I'm sort of trying to approach this in a way of how do you start from a sound and how do you start to connect these two bits together? Because what flummox me, I think, um, with a, you know, a good, simple, little fun synth like this is that I'm trying to, to, to dig into those, to dig beyond the preset so that I'm not bamboozled by what's going on. Because I want more than anything to not just become a preset surfer. I don't want that. Uh, it can be enjoyable, <laughs> but as far as actually making a sound in wrestling with a synthesizer, I don't want that. I want to be able to understand where all the different bits are going and how they relate to each other. Because then I can make the sound that's, that's something to do with me, something to do with what I'm trying to do. Um, and all of that is available within uh, the matrix, which initially feels quite complex, but actually it comes together quite quickly. And these three assignable tracks here are awesome. Uh, you just hold one and you turn a knob and you can then direct either the cycling envelope, the regular envelope, the LFO, pressure, ooh, or um, uh, the key up thing. I guess that's just sending values. And you can, uh, you can uh, direct that to whatever parameter you've just chosen and moved about with. Very interesting. Completely different. I mean, I can go back here and do a thing again. <laughs> And I'm instantly all over it. Here, less so. <laughs> But what you do get, what you do get in the Microfreak is this ability to travel to different places. I mean, within the, the Crave, you're also always going to stay in a, in a familiar space. You know, the sounds you're going to make are going to be sounds you expect to make, sounds you're going to make with half a dozen other uh, monosynths. With the Microfreak, you find yourself in places where you weren't expecting to make that sort of sound, you weren't intending to make that sort of sound, you may not even like that sort of sound, but it has the potential to be uh, enormously versatile in, in any situation. You can do all sorts of things with it. And that, I guess, is the charm of this compared to the familiarity of this. They're very different creatures. So what I thought I might try to do, because I've got some patch cables here, this doesn't have a whole lot of CV, it has a little bit. It has a, uh, an out for the keyboard and a gate, and also an out for something else that I had an out for. What was the other thing I had an out for? Pressure, there we go. So the control voltage, as far as the microfreak is concerned, is all out, and it's all to do with the keyboard. So the magic keyboard can now be used to play other things. So at the very least, I should be able to patch this into there to make it make a sound. That might be nice. There, I wonder whether that works with the ARP. I don't know, let's find out. So, uh, cables, I don't know, let's see what, have I got, what's the longest I have? This is about the longest I have. Might have to uh, do a little bit of jimmying around. So, in the back here somewhere, if I just take the CV output. Now, I've got to guess, no, no, I don't have to guess. I have to use my extraordinary knowledge to know where this goes into here to make that do a thing. So, uh, oh, the the black ones are out, these ones are in. <laughs> Come on, make it easy for me. 
Oh, what do we think? So, oscillator CV. Oscillator CV is that. Is that, is that, is that a thing with a mix? Press up reset hold. Maybe I'm asking too much. So, let's stick it in there. Boom. So, um, so I've got oscillator FM, oscillator mod, I've got oscillator CV, but that doesn't seem to be one volt per octave, which is kind of what I was looking for, I guess. VCA CV? See, if this is labelled up as a, uh, as a Martha 32, as somebody said that it was, then that, no, because that's, no, that's just envelope, isn't it? It's external audio. May be oil bar, play stop tempo. I mean, I could do that. I've got tempo sync out on the back. How can I just run the two together? What a clock out. Oh, come on, I must be able to brain my way into this. Those are all outs. I can modulate. So, for instance, if I was to take Let's try and do something simple. Let's take the pressure output, plug that into filter cutoff. So if I turn this one down for a bit, if I stop it doing whatever it is I'm doing, get rid of that. Source, if I cut off that's in. Oh, yeah, there we go. Look at that. See, like, I know what I'm doing. Okay, I, in my head, right, it's just decided to, that, to tell me I should do a certain thing, and now the potential of that working is quite low. But I could potentially, if I put that in record, because I did this, I've done this, right? What you do is you can record a pattern. Um, all right, let's record a pattern in step mode. Sequencer I want, sequencer on, record a pattern. Okay and then set that in motion. Yeah, okay, that's playing. And what I want to do, oh yeah, but how would you do pressure? How would you then record pressure if I haven't done that already? Well, let's see if that's making any effect over here. No, so, how do would I do that? Because in my head I'm thinking, well, I could set up like a range of pressures over here which then could affect this. I don't think that's gonna work, is it? If I put random on, that's not seeing that as a thing. Because you can record four channels of modulation uh, on this over the top of the th stuff that you've done. So if you've got your, your thing going on, oh, I've, that I've broken, um, you stick it in record and then you can record things over the top and then another thing over the top of that. As you can hear, let's record another one over the top. But what I can't work out is whether I can take the pressure within that sequence and apply it into here. All right, well, maybe let's try this simpler. Maybe I'll try it with uh, an arpeggiator. Okay, that's doing stuff I don't care about. 
I'm just going to vary my pressing down on that to see whether it has. No, bugger all is what the answer to that is. See, it's there. There's definitely something there. The only thing that annoys me is that I simply can't, I'd like to be able to play this one from this one and then the pressure would make some kind of sense. But because the Crave doesn't appear, at least as far as I could tell without Googling it, but then Google's not gonna tell us anything. So this isn't out yet. If we're gonna find a, a one volt for octave input, some kind of input to trigger uh, the thing, to trigger the notes, then that's not gonna work. But I mean, at, at least I can show that that does do what it says. Yeah, interesting. Right, so there we go. There's the, there's the Micro Freak and there's the Crave, completely different animals. Both of them are soon to be available and both of them, I mean, I'd like to say similarly priced, but actually I don't have the faintest idea. And the prices will probably come up down here somewhere at some point. If not, I mean, ask your local shop, I suppose. But completely, completely different. Complimentary? No, <laughs> because it's quite difficult to get them to work together, at least in my, uh, you know, a little bit of fiddling right now. But they exist in completely different spheres. So if you're looking for something um, uh, to sit next to each other that work differently, then ideal. But if you're looking for something which is going to fit nicely with something else, then perhaps these two are not, are, are not going to be doing that. But that's because they're very individual. They're very much about their own thing. I mean, there's a whole lot of patching on here that you can be doing uh, that I haven't touched on at all, including it's even got a multiple in here, which I think is really nice. But you can get in there and uh, modulate most things if you had something else. A bit of Eurorack stuffed into there would be awesome, or coming out of there into something else would be great. Um, the uh, the Microfreak has less going for it in terms of a larger setup, I suppose. But you've got MIDI, you've got USB MIDI, you've got all that kind of control. So it's not alone by any stretch. Just trying to think of ways in which this incorporates into a larger hardware situation. Uh, I think in, with both of them, uh, the fact they have sequences and arpeggiators means that you can sit at them and just play and enjoy. Uh, I confess uh, that the, the Crave has been more fun for me <laughs> because it rewards what I already know. Whereas the Micro Freak is more difficult because I have to learn stuff and I have to get in there. And that's very much a valid form of synthesis and a valid thing to do. And it's up to me to spend the time to learn and understand it. But this one would be immediately rewarding. This one rewards you down the road later once you've worked all those sorts of things out. So there you go. There's my first look at the Arturia Micro Freak and the Behringer Crave. I hope that was interesting and useful to you. And with a bit of luck, I'll be able to do some more interesting stuff here at the Tonum Synth Reactor. And in the meantime, Go and make some tunes.